Hello, and welcome to Section 2, Smart Contracts with Solidity. In this section, we'll start by looking at the Remix compiler in more detail. We'll also be looking at the contract code we deployed previously in Section 1 in closer detail. After that, in the video Compiling, Deploying, and Testing Smart Contracts Using Remix, we'll be deploying a rewritten version of our Hello World contract that will work in up-to-date versions of Solidity. This will also act as a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to compile and deploy our own smart contracts. Since the last time we were deploying contracts, we were mainly focused on getting our Remix and MetaMask configurations set up correctly. Next thing, we'll be taking a look at incorporating two important tools, Web3 and Infura, that will allow us to bootstrap an actual Ethereum application. Once we have an application instance, or DAP, end users will be able to communicate with our smart contracts through the web page or a web app. Finally, in our last video of the section titled Deploying and Interacting with Testnets, we'll be leveraging Infura and Web3 to interact with the contract we deploy to the Kovan testnet. We'll be taking a deeper dive into programming Solidity contracts using the online IDE hosted at remix.ethereum.org. Before we go further, let's pause for a moment and think about what we've already learned. Using MetaMask and our Kovan testnet ether, we know that we can compile and deploy smart contracts to the Kovan testnet using Remix. Remix gives us access to Web3 and debugging tools in the JavaScript console, and as we saw in section one, the JavaScript environment provided by Remix also gives us the console output of our function calls to our smart contract. So here we are, back with our Hello World contract which we deployed during section one. Looking at this code, we might notice some of it's not all that different than code we may see in other languages. A main difference, however, is this semantic structure, contract. Contracts in Solidity are similar to classes in object-oriented programming languages. Each contract can contain declarations of state variables, functions, function modifiers, events, struct types, and enum types. Furthermore, contracts can inherit both the data and data structures from other contracts. Actually, we've seen that already in the contract currently displayed on the screen. In this Solidity file, we have two contracts that we deployed to the Kovan testnet as one contract using inheritance. That means, because we deployed the greeter contract, we also deployed, by extension, an instance of the mortal contract. Now the next thing that we'll do is we'll start to unpack this program line by line, starting with the topmost declaration pragma solidity higher than 0.4.9. This first line is a declaration you will need to make as the first line of any Solidity file that you will program. The pragma directive determines which version of the Solidity compiler to use when compiling your code. If I go to the Remix compiler settings and change the compiler version, you're going to see that our contract won't compile anymore. That's because I changed to a different version of the Solidity compiler, and like most blockchain and DAP tools, Solidity is being updated and improved upon all the time. More on that later, but for now, let's switch back to 0.4.9, where we know our project compiles correctly. As you can see, there is a monumental amount of commits to this repository. Somewhere in here is our target version. And there we go, we're compiling again with the correct compiler, and the error messages go away. The next line of our contract, contract mortal, is where we declare our first contract called mortal, which will be inherited by the greeter contract when we deploy it. Moving to the next line, we declare a variable called owner, and assign it the data type address. This is the data type that might be new for some developers. It's a special data type in Solidity contracts that means the data type 
inside an address type variable is an Ethereum wallet address. Or, to be a bit more technical, this data type holds a 20 byte value, which is the exact size of an Ethereum address. More importantly, address types also have members and serve as a base for all contracts. In other words, address types are how we interact with users on the Ethereum network. Or, as is the case with this code, it's how we can declare the owner of the contract. For example, the person who deployed it. In the next line, which is a function declaration and the function code, that's exactly what we're going to do. A contract's message.sender is the address currently interacting with the contract, be it a human or another contract. Since we're the ones deploying the contract, the value of message.sender is going to be the wallet address of the address in MetaMask that was used to deploy the contract. And that's how we set the owner variable with an Ethereum address. It's noteworthy to mention here that because this function shares the same name as the contract itself, it's being defined here as the contract's constructor. We can see that mortal, mortal, and of course, they both share the same case, namely an uppercase M. And that's how we declare a constructor in this particular version of Solidity. Moving to the next line, we have another function declaration and the contents of the function, meaning the function code. We have the kill function. This line of code is an implementation of Ethereum's special self-destruct function, a function that allows us to quote-unquote destroy our contract. As you probably guessed, this line of code is a function to make the contract unusable, and it can only be called by the owner of the contract. We can say that self-destruct makes a contract unusable rather than destroys it. It's not a true destructor function. This is an important distinction because a contract address is immutable and it won't become invalid or missing once the contract is destroyed using a self-destruct function. What actually happens when we call the contract's self-destruct function is that the code and the state of the contract become invalid even though the contract address remains callable. Our next line of code is the opening of our greeter contract, which inherits the mortal contract, which we've just unpacked. The greeter contract gets an owner declared by the mortal contract's contract constructor, and the greeter contract also inherits an instance of mortal's destructor function automatically making the greeter contract able to be rendered unusable when the contract owner calls the kill function on greeter. The next line of code that we'll be looking at is the variable declaration greeting. This is where our greeting will be stored, so we set its data type to be a string. The next we have an opening declaration for our function greeter. This is the greeter contract's constructor function which is declared once again as constructor by virtue of sharing the name of the contract itself. And we can see that here. You can see that here. We make sure that case is the same and we have a constructor. This function takes as a parameter a message to be returned to users that call the greet function at a later time. You can see that here. In truth, we actually could have hard-coded this value into the contract. And if we had done it that way, we wouldn't have had to declare the words hello world into Remix when we deployed the contract. Let's take a look at what it would look like to do the contract that way. But first of all, before we do that, let's see what it looks like now. The moment we need to use this box, to pass our message, which as you can see, because of this syntax here, which shares the variable being injected into the constructor, we know that we're actually setting the contents of this 
variable, which is passed into this variable space afterwards. But instead of doing that, because we've already done that, what we can actually do is set our message here. Of course, the other thing that we're going to have to do is remove any parameters being injected into the constructor. So that looks good. What we'll do is we'll remove the other compile success messages and we'll try compiling again. And we're good. So now, with this code changed and no dependencies sent to the greeter constructor, let's go ahead and deploy this. When we select the run tab, we see we no longer have to fill out any fields in order to deploy the contract. That information is being hard coded into the constructor. So let's go ahead and deploy. Now that we have block confirmations and we know that our transaction's been mined, let's just give ourselves a better view of the debugging console. If we look here, see that our transaction is mined, execution succeeded. Now we know that we can test calling the greet function again. When we look at the output, we see that the output is the same, a string containing the words, hello world. And we can see that this version of the contract is working to give the same output as when we were injecting the hello world message as a parameter to the constructor function. And lastly, of course, we have our magical greet function, which is the function that actually returns the data when we call greeter.greet. And we see that all it actually does is return greeting, which we hard-coded here.